All right, so to pick up where we left off yesterday, uh, the very end of class, one of the things I, guys, I got you guys to do is to write your address in a very odd format. Uh, and what we discovered is that is it possible, and it's something you already knew, but it was kind of just looking at it from a dynamic picture, is it, is it possible for two different people living not in the same house to have the same address? No, it's physically impossible. So the electrons are the exact same way. So we're going to treat electrons like little people. They each have their own address. Now, but we, if, if like someone says, where do you live, you give them your address. But if you ask an electron where it lives, what would it give you? It's quantum numbers. And how many were there? Four. And what was the acronym? No. The acronym. PAMS. Okay. And, and I don't want to go, well, I'll do it just for the sake of argument, just doing it. So this is it right here. Principal, angular, magnetic, and spin. Let me go ahead and tell you um, I'm not going to be here tomorrow. So you will have a video to watch. And it is going to start here. And it is going to go through all of this part of it. Okay, so just forewarning you, that's where you're going to be tomorrow because I'm not going to be here. Um, and so let's go back up to where we need to be today. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, today is going to get really freaky. It's going to get really weird. And it's going to really hurt your brain. And it's not because it's like hard. It's because it's strange. And it's things that you've never thought about. And I can't answer them. The reason we're talking about it is because it's a question they still don't know the answer to. But I think the video really helps sums up what the problem is. Yes, sir? No, you're right. Okay. All right. Next week, the end of next week. You know, all right, by the way, if y'all want to take a picture of it, I'm going to send it out to uh, through the remind uh, the, the later. You can get it later, okay? But that is the midterm schedule. Uh, <laughs> we have a regular class day Monday and Tuesday, and then the midterms are Wednesday, Thursday. Fine. So, uh, picking back up here, like I said, this is going to be real strange today. Don't let it melt your brain to the point where he's like, I can't do this because that, what the, the, the part we're going to cover, some of it is important, but the video that I'm going to show you that's really weird has nothing to do with the actual class and the test, but it's just additional information. So we need to talk about this guy named Louis de Broly. Okay, Louis de Broly, that's his picture. There. It looks like he has a five head, doesn't he? Somebody said a six head with that big old forehead. Um, so what did de Broly do? What did he say? <laughs> Louis, French scientist Louis de Broly suggested electrons. Now, again, we're not talking about light. We're talking about the electrons running around an atom can be considered waves. That is very important. So you need to know de Broly said that they act like waves. Okay? But he also went a little bit further. He said they are confined to the space around the nucleus. Now, is that something we already know is true? Yeah, because if you didn't have the electron clouds, you wouldn't have an atom. That's the whole purpose of this. So, but they travel like waves. Now, this is different from Bohr. Remember what did we said about Bohr? He was boring because he was what? He was wrong. He, Bohr said they traveled like, the particles traveled like planets. And what did he call those paths they traveled in? Or bits. Okay. Now, we're going to adjust that today. Because what de Broly said is actually correct to a degree. And we'll talk about what degree he is correct. So what he's go ahead. Half and half. He, what he, he is right about the fact they travel like waves. But there was one little part that he was wrong about. Bohr said it's... <laughs> That's a bracket. Sorry. Or bits. That's why I don't like print. That's why I don't write parentheses. You notice every time I do stuff, it's a bracket because I don't do parentheses real well. It looks like C's. So Bohr said they were or bits. But what De Broly said is that follow that it followed that electron waves exist only at specific frequencies. Okay, which that means they travel at a certain rate up and down, up and down. And then we've seen this formula before, right? E equals. Remember what H was? Not the, not the big H, this is little h. It's some constant. Planck's constant. Okay, This is Planck's constant. We've looked at that formula. So the energy equals Planck's constant times, and that's not a V, that's a nu, which is frequency. So we talked about Planck, who came up with that, and then we, remember we talked about uh, Einstein, um, adjusted it a little bit. 
These frequencies corresponded to the specific energy values of Bohr's orbit. So basically what de Broglie did is he took the orbits that Bohr created and he gave them specific energy levels. Because remember what we said, can electrons go up and down energy levels? Okay. If I take you outside and I say jump to the roof, what do you have to have in order to get up there? You've got to have, <laughs> you've got to have energy. Just, just, that's, <laughs> you've got to have energy. Now, in an electron, it's called absorption, okay? So that's what you would have to do to be able to get up top. But once you get up there, can I push you back off? And when you hit the ground, are you going to release that energy? Now, what's that fancy science word? It means releasing energy. An E word. Emission. Very good. So that's what he was talking about, is that these specific wavelengths can have uh, these things. Now, here's another aspect that electrons are very similar to light. Because remember, at the very beginning of this chapter, we talked about that electromagnetic spectrum and how light travels as waves. And this is how we can also connect electrons to light because of two things. Electrons, light, light waves can be bent. This is the science word you need to know. It can be diffracted or diffraction. That is the process of diffracting light. And what does diffracting mean? Bending of light. Very good. So diffraction is the bending of light. Now, and how does light travel? In what form? In a wave. So that's why it says diffraction refers to the bending of waves as it passes by the edge of an object or through an opening. So that's the first thing electrons can do in the form of a wave. The second thing they can do is electron beams, like waves, can also interfere with each other. Okay? So, how many of y'all ever, and I know guys, you all did it. Growing up, if you were in a swimming pool, you called Rock the Pool, or I don't know what you called it, but where everybody was constantly jumping in, trying to make the waves get bigger and bigger and bigger. Right? I mean, we've all probably seen some form of that. But whenever one person jumped in on one side and the other person jumped in on the other side, what did the waves do from each person as they met? They collide and they go through each other, right? That is interfering with each other. And there was some form of energy transfer. How weird would it have been if those waves had hit each other and stopped and fell? Okay. Would there be current in the ocean? No, because every time it hit something, it would stop. But we know waves have the ability to transfer energy back and forth, right? So what happens when a wave is rolling along and hits a wall or hits or hits a barrier? What does it do? It bounces back. So the energy travels through and then comes back out. So there's the exact same kind of concepts. The next science word you need to know is interference. Okay? And the definition of interference is when waves overlap. And you've seen this your entire life, but you've just never known that was called interference of waves. So that's what it's called. So we've got diffraction, which bends it, and interference, which overlaps it. Okay, go ahead. Uh, kind of. That has more or less to do with, yeah, no, I was, I was thinking differently, but you're exactly right. So why can you get stations in the night better? It's because there's less interference in the air of keeping things from of coming further. Does that make sense? Yeah, very, very good point. All right, so. Uh, two things. Y'all don't have this page, but if I, I kind of wish I had left it in there now because uh, there was two things I want to point out about it. So we have light as a wave phenomenon, and then we have light as a stream of photons. There's one person up to this point that said they travel like photons, and who was it? Einstein. Einstein always seems to be the odd guy out. So the other two people we've talked about thus far was Planck and de Broglie. And those were the two that said they traveled like waves. And we're going to add a little bit more to it uh, in just a few seconds. But this is where the wheels kind of fall off. Uh, so I'm fixing to show you guys the video of how this works in a weird way. Okay? Um, I'm not going to video this. So if you're watching this at home, go to YouTube and look up the wave nature of electrons. And if you even want to watch this at home, that's the title of the YouTube video, Wave Nature of Electrons. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you, it's kind of a silly video. It's a cartoon, but the impact is really good, like what he talks about. This is Professor Quantum. So, again, it is silly, but it's really, as you can tell, that got really weird, didn't it? And this is why we still don't understand what all this stuff really means. And they, they still to this day don't know what an electron actually travels like because it travels like both. So when you just let it happen, it travels like a wave. And when you watch it, it travels like an electron. And so that's where this comes into play. Heisenberg. You ever heard that?
Sorry, that name? From what? Breaking Bad. That's the Hindenburg. That's the Hindenburg. Eisenberg is the character, is the drug dealer's name, the the fake name of the guy in Breaking Bad. So this is actually a real guy. Like he he is um, he's a real person. That's where he got his name from. And it's kind of interesting about if you really think about what Heisenberg did, it kind of makes sense to the character in the show. It's really kind of cool if y'all have ever seen that show. Anybody ever watched that, like the whole thing? I don't know how y'all did it. It's a weird show. Yeah, and I'm a chemistry person. I don't like it. So Werner Heisenberg proposed that, and this is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. He, pr uh, he proposed that any attempt to locate a specific electron with a photon, which means we're going to hit it with a ball of light, which means we're going to try to put some energy into it, knocks the electron off of its course. Okay? And so put a big star beside the second bullet. This is the part you need to know. This is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. This is what he said. He said, it is impossible, which means what? It can't be done. It is impossible to determine simultaneously. What does that mean? At the same time. It is impossible. It can't be done to determine at the same time both the position and the velocity of an electron. So what that means is you can know where it is, but you can't know where it's going. Or you can know where it's going, but you don't know where it came from. You can't know both. And let me, this down here at the bottom says mouse and the flashlight example. How many of you hate mice? Like, they're like your biggest fear. Okay, how about a cockroach? I hit, I hit some more songs with that. So let's pretend it's a cockroach. So let's say I put you in a small dark room, no lights, and I hand you a flashlight, and it only works for a second. That's it. You can't cut it on and use it to shine. Whenever you cut that flashlight on and spot that roach, and as soon as it cuts off, where does it go? You don't know. As soon as you find it and that light cuts back off, where is it going? You have no clue. Probably up your leg. <laughs> so the point is, is it's just like an electron. You okay over there? <laughs> so the point is, is that you can find it, but once you do, you don't know where it's going after that. Now, the one part about this that I need to, to make it a little more clear is, you know what a position is. What's a position? Yeah, it's a location. Okay. But the word velocity kind of throws some people off. What is another word that people interchange for velocity? Speed. There's a difference between speed and velocity. And here's the difference. Velocity has a direction. Okay? Velocity has a direction. And that term, and if you want to write it, this is not so this is more of a physics thing. But anytime you have something that has a direction, it's called a vector. And you may have heard that word in different uh, things, especially when you took physical science a few years back. But a vector means a direction. Okay, It's telling you where it's going. And that's how velocity is different than speed. So again, Heisenberg uncertainty principle states, it is impossible to determine at the same time where an electron is and where it's going. And the one thing that I want to point out that you should be like, okay, that makes sense. What speed are all these things traveling at? Speed of light, which is how much? 300 million, 3 times 10 to the 8. And so that kind of makes sense. Well, if they're traveling that fast, I can see why it's really hard to be able to attempt one of those things. So here's another reason why they said, you know what, we do think it travels like light. So an x-ray, do you all have this picture? Okay, good. An x-ray. Is an x-ray a part of the electromagnetic spectrum? Okay, what's a very simple word for the electromagnetic spectrum? Light. So is x-ray a form of light? But just like we've been saying, can you see it with your eyeballs? No, but it is real. Okay. So what they did is they took some x-rays and they shot it through, what is AL foil? Aluminum foil. And this was the result. This is what they saw. This was the pattern they, that was created. But then the other picture is they shot some electrons through the exact same aluminum foil. And what do you notice about those pictures? Would you agree that they are similar? Okay. Would you agree that they're similar enough to know that if we know that x-rays are light and they travel in waves, is it plausible, and again, I'll use that Mythbuster term, to assume that it could also be assumed that electrons travel just like that, simply based on the picture? Okay. And so this was just an interesting concept that they were able to use this type of uh, image to say, well, we've got some proof that we think this is how it travels simply based on the pattern 
that is repetitious and repeats through anything. Do you do you think if they shot, let's say, some infrared or some UV light, would it create a very similar pattern to this? Because it's the same thing. It's all light. It may not be the exact same width and diameter and the same rings, but it's going to create a very similar circular pattern. Yes, sir. What changed it? It That's talking about the energy levels that they go up and down. Yes, it would. They Basically, they just shot that through it and saw what popped up. Okay? All right, so then this guy showed up. Edward, Ed, Erwin Schrodinger. This guy's name is Schrodinger. Have you ever heard of Schrodinger's cat? If you, if you watch Big Bang Theory, they kind of talk about Schrodinger's cat. I'll show you all a video in just a second of what Schrodinger uh, said. So in 1926, Austrian physicist. Now, first of all, 1926, how long ago was that? It was 90 years ago. My granddad's 96. He was six years old when this guy did this. I mean, my granddad's significantly old, but in terms of scientific history, is this really old? No, I mean, this is this is pretty recent. This was, in the, I mean, in the last 90 years. So what he did, what Erwin Schrodinger said, is he developed an equation. We're going to see that equation in just a second. That treated electrons as waves. Now, this guy was able to mathematically prove that they traveled like a what? A wave. Very good. So together with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which we just talked about, the Schrodinger wave equation laid the foundation for the modern quantum theory, which is what we believe today. I do need you to know two things about this guy. One, Schrodinger said they travel like what? Waves. And he developed the modern quantum theory. And all quantum means is really, really, really small. Okay? So it's a lot of energy and a really small thing. So quantum theory describes mathematically the wave properties of electrons and other very small particles. Okay. Now, here's the bad news for you guys. Uh, here is his formula. Uh-huh. I'm just kidding. You really don't have to mess with it. Okay. The good news is, is you don't have to know this. But I did not want you to, to, to say, oh, it must be some simple thing. Uh, no. -uh. This is his Schrodinger's equation. Now, the part that I find most fascinating about this whole thing, and y'all may think it's all garbage and rubbish, um, is this thing right here called the Laplacian operator. This upside-down triangle squared is that. So that has to be substituted in <laughs> again. And I know what you're thinking. Excuse my friends, but who in the hell does this, right? Who comes up with this kind of crazy stuff? They're well beyond us. We can't even imagine this math and, and how they figured it out and, and what all they do with it. Say that again. Have I? No. But I have done this one. Uh, whenever I took a modern physics class, it was physics three. Um, this We actually had to use this one and figure out the energy of the frequency of a specific orbital. Uh, it's, it's not as bad as it looks. Um, it's all about force and math. There's a lot of constants that are involved. So, I mean, if you can know all the constants and, know, and figure out what the frequency is, it's really not as intense as it looks. This one isn't. The other one I've never even worked with. Um, but we did have to use all of this. So I just want you to kind of see how all of this stuff works as far as, as what it looks like. Um, so, I mean, just, just as an example, like this part right here, like this is the harmonic oscillator example where that all that plugs into E. I mean, but I've, I've worked with F equals MA and then equals negative KX. I've worked with kinetic energy, potential energy. So it's taking the basic physics stuff and putting those formulas together to create something bigger is all, is all it is. Now, the other stuff at the bottom, whatever. You got the Hamiltonian operator in there for H. And I don't know. I have no idea. So this is the big thing about Schrodinger. His math was able to prove Bohr wrong. We've already said we knew Bohr was wrong, but this was the guy that did it. We said Bohr said they traveled in orbits like planets, but Schrodinger developed the idea of this word. And this word you're going to hear for the rest of this chapter, the rest of this year, orbitals. Okay, orbitals. And I need you to know that bottom uh, bullet, that is a test question, the definition of an orbital. I'm telling you now, that is a test question. An orbital 
is a three-dimensional region. Now, what does three-dimensional mean? It's got all three sides. It's got a height, a, a length, and a depth. Okay? It's a three-dimensional region around the nucleus. Now, we already know that. What subatomic particle have we been talking about this entire chapter? Subatomic particle. Thank you. Electrons. It's in, around, it's in an area around the nucleus. We already know that. But this is the key word that indicates a probable location. What does probable mean? You might potentially be in that specific case. So if, if your parents knew you were at school, they know you are in Northview High School, right? But do they know exactly where you are in this building? Some of them may know you might be in my class, but if they walk to the front door, they might not know how to get to my room. Okay? So it's kind of like the electron. We know what's in the atom, and we know what part of the atom it's in, but we don't know exactly where it is. Okay? They may know you're in a science class. I know this is the science wing, but there's seven rooms on this hallway. So it could be in a specific location, but it's hard to pinpoint exactly where it is. And again, if you were moving at the speed of light, would it be really hard to find you? Uh-huh. It's really hard. And so this is what Schrodinger's main accomplishment was, is he proved mathematically about the orbital concept. And this is a theory, this is an idea of what the orbital kind of is. So this, what we used to call the electron cloud. Now, why do you think it has a, the name cloud? Where do you think that came from? It's kind of a hazy look. There's not really an end to it. And that's one of the challenging aspects about this math stuff is that it's not a circle. It's not a sphere. It's, it's a region of probability. And what this uh, figure over here on the right says is hard to read it. But it says, um, is a surface within which the electron can be found a certain percentage of the time Con conventionally, they say about 90% of the time, it is somewhere in that area, somewhere in that orbital. Does that kind of make sense? So that's what's going on from this particular perspective. We good with that? Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Um, so here's what I want to do. I'm going to um, stop the video and do. we're going to do two.